Welcome to this workshop, which is Syria and Palestine. And it's the third of a series of workshops that uh, the Syria Solidarity Movement has been um, able to present here at the World Social Forum, and we're very pleased to have been able to do so. Um, it, we are happy um, for your presence. It's fine. We don't feel bad that uh, there are only four people here because in the last few days we've had the first workshop where uh, there was standing room only. The second one yesterday there were 20 people. So, you know, we feel pretty good about the fact that uh, we were able to talk to people about something that the mass media and the, uh, um, and the governments in the West are hiding from uh, their citizens. And if we can reach 60, 70 people, and if we can send out the video uh, by social media, it's really worth it for us. And we're really glad you're here. So, um, today, uh, I'm uh, very pleased uh, to be able to present Professor Noor El, El Qadri. Professor Qadri is a professor of strategic management and governance, governance at the University of Ottawa. He's a former vice president of the Canadian Arab Federation, and he's a frequent commentator on TV on issues pertaining to the Middle East. Um, professor Qadri is going to talk about uh, uh, some of the misconceptions that have taken place in the Palestinian movement, I know because I'm involved in that, um, in the Palestinian movement, there are some people who blame the, pa the Syrian government for this terrible tragedy upon the Palestinian people who live or lived in Syria who have been made refugees a second time. I know there are people who blame, I know people personally in the Palestinian movement who blame this on the Syrian government. And in my opinion, this is not the fault of the Syrian government. It's the fault of the countries who have created this war of aggression against Syria. And I'm sure Professor Qadri will talk about that. Um, after Professor Qadri speaks, since it's a very small group, we could have a discussion. Sure. Uh, and uh, people could feel free to add, uh, make, make comments, or ask questions. And uh, we could stay. We have the room till 3.30, so we can take as long as we want. Afterwards, uh, I have. Uh, uh, some uh, materials here for for you. Oh, you've got the materials that are free. My pamphlet uh, is for sale. It's to find Syria, and it's five dollars. It's based on the tour that I took uh, to Syria with the uh, second international tour of peace to Syria. A third tour is going in September, if people are interested in going. And the other book that we're selling is a very good book by a Montrealer named Eve Engler, Building Apartheid, oh, um, and Canada and Israel Building Apartheid, it also is only $5. So those will be available afterwards, and I will probably go around while Professor Carter is speaking, and uh, if you're interested, we've had many people sign up for our Salt Syria Solidarity um, email list. So, Without further ado, then. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Ken, uh, for this introduction. I think uh, my mom doesn't speak about me like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's become a big fan of me over the last few days. So, <laughs> um, uh, since we are a small group, I would rather um, speak for a shorter period of time. I was thinking of speaking about about 50 minutes. 50 minutes. So now I probably cut them in half, and we'll, uh, uh, we'll do a discussion, and uh, this way I will probably fill in the gaps based on, on the discussion. But uh, what I wanted to uh, start with is, many people think, okay, Palestine is a, is a country, uh, Syria is a country, Lebanon is a country, Jordan is a country, each one of them uh, has its um, differences, its support groups, and what the essence of that is, is that in the older days, these used to be one country. Um, we still refer to those in the history books as the Levant, or the Fertile Crescent, or the uh, countries of uh, the Levant, but they are all under um, the same umbrella. 
It was in 1916 when uh, sykes picot Accord happened, uh, and it was a secret accord on dividing uh, that area of, uh, of the Levant. And they uh, said, okay, we're going to divide this into multiple countries, and uh, Iraq and Jordan are going to be under uh, the British mandate. Lebanon and Syria are going to be under the French mandate. Uh, Palestine will leave it under an international uh, kind of governance for a little period of time because there were other plans for, uh, for Palestine. And of course, uh, uh, that secret accord uh, became public in 1917 when uh, they had the Bolshevik revolution in, in Russia and that accord has been, has been leaked. So it was secret. They wanted to make it secret for some time. It became public by mistake after the Bolshevik after the revolution in, uh, in in Russia, and that's when the foreign minister of the not so great Britain <laughs> back then, uh, Balfour, declared. Oh my God, so <laughs> I'm, I'm a professor at the school, and I usually. I usually have punishments for my students who have, yeah. uh, and the punishment is that they have to tell a joke. <laughs> so that sykes pico Accord became public. Belfour came with a declaration in 1917. Foreign Minister of Britain promising a land that he does not own in Palestine for a third people, the Jewish people. And what the biggest fallacy that we've seen in the media after that is that Palestine is the promised land. It's a land without people, for people without land. And that was the biggest mistake that was sold, or misinformation and disinformation that was sold uh, throughout many places around uh, the world in a controlled Media, we did not have social media back then. And to my surprise, many people in the West, Western countries, when I travel, when I talk to them, they don't know where Palestine is on the map. They don't know that Palestine existed. Okay? They know okay, Israel and where is Palestine. There is conflict. And they think that Israel is some land that has nothing to do with, with Palestine. And it's often the case that we have to start with one one on these things. It's def definitely not with the activists like, like yourselves. With that in mind, the Palestinians had to face that fate in 1948 with the establishment of the State of Israel. Uh, a big majority of them became, became refugees. The majority of them held the keys for their houses because they thought that this is going to be uh, a few days and they're going to go back to their homes. And it's been, uh, they've been refugees since 1948. Some of them fled to Lebanon. Some of them fled to Jordan, Syria, to Tunisia, to Egypt, many places around the world. And they've been since then uh, going through all that, um, all these challenges around, around the world. The Palestinians. had different fates in these countries. And I will try to tell you some anecdotes. When I was in my high school in, in Lebanon, uh, I would, the top five students in my class, graduating class in high school, three of them were Palestinians. One of them went to the Lebanese University, graduated with a medical school, but he cannot work in Lebanon because the syndicates prevent Palestinians in Lebanon to work or with their medical doctors. Another one joined me at the American University of Beirut and he graduated in computer engineering, but he cannot work in Lebanon because again the Syndicate of Engineers, the Order of Engineers, they cannot allow them to work. I lost touch with the with the third one. But those are simple specific examples to tell you that the top students in some of the best schools in Lebanon they write the official exams of the baccalaureate in Lebanon. They are highly ranked. In many places around the world, they get the scholarships. Here, they get to graduate from universities, but they are denied some of their basic rights 
which is working, working in their professional field. Well, the case is not better in Egypt, it's not better in Jordan. Jordan Palestinians are, are treated as second class people, and there have been many, many cases in that. But the reason I'm telling you all of this is the sole country that have treated the Palestinians as humans was Syria. In Syria, the Palestinians were not in regular refugee camps like the ones that were in Lebanon. Because if you go to any refugee camp in Lebanon, even the Lebanese authorities are afraid to go to those refugee camps. They became a became, became poverty ghettos where all the troubles exist. Uh, people live in houses that are not equipped neither for the hot summers nor for the very cold winters. Uh, drinking water is not available for them. Lots of problems on the health side. So you can see all kinds of troubles in these refugee camps in Lebanon. They were created as temporary places, like the Syrian temporary places now in Lebanon or Turkey or Jordan for refugees. But those temporary places became permanent for six years. You've got people who were born in the camp and they are 60 years and 65 years old now. They lived all that life in a miserable way on the way. In Syria, they called them camps, but the camps had all the services from the government. Those camps, they had the same drinking water that all the Syrians would have, 24-7 electricity outlets into there. The Syrian, the Palestinians in Syria were able to go get their education, they work in all the ranks, even in the army they had their own division. Yeah. We call it the Brigade of Palestine, the Palestine. So they got, they are, this is the only place where they were treated as humans in Syria. And under successive governments, and of course, we all know that the reign of Hafez al-Assad has been long there since the 70s until now, the so-called dictator or uh, military uh, uh, ruler, for a long period of time, he gave the Palestinians most of the rights that they, that humans would ask for. Under Bashar al-Assad, they had the same thing. So they have got mainly all their rights in the country. They go to Syrian hospitals, they're treated like Syrians, they don't pay a penny. They get their drugs for free, medical drugs for free. They go to education, to universities, they graduate with pharmacy degrees, with doctor degrees, with law degrees for free. They pay the administration fee, it's about $2 per year. And it's a very um, high level uh, system that exists in, in that country. I stated some facts over the last couple of workshops. Syria was a vibrant society. In C Syria, in the last six years before the crisis, they ran six balanced budgets. They had no debt. 90% uh, of the people, they own their houses mortgage-free, including Palestinians who can own their houses in Syria. Uh, the government has introduced all kinds of uh, decrees that is giving more rights to people. Education is free at all levels, including higher education, university degrees, master's and PhD degrees. Uh, medical services are available for, for everyone for, uh, for free. Most of the basic things are subsidized by the government, and Palestinians enjoy these subsidies, whether it has to do with, with sugar, or rice, or wheat, or bread. Or so so you, people get them for pennies compared to, to the regular market because the government subsidizes these things. And it's one of their uh, ways to fight poverty. So they were fighting poverty by making sure that everybody has the right to get those basic needs. So nobody goes to, there are no food banks in Syria because nobody has to go to the food bank. Given our, all that synopsis, he can say, okay, well, what is happening in Syria to the Palestinians? The Palestinians 
had to suffer like anybody else in, in Syria. But the Syrian government has supported resistance and that's no, uh, uh, no secret to anybody. They've supported uh, many factions in Lebanon, including Hezbollah. They've supported many factions in Palestine, including Hamas. And, but, but the Turkish and Saudi involvement in Syria, they put an Islamist agenda on the opposition side. And since the creation of ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra and many other terrorist groups that beat the same drums uh, like Jabhat al-Nusra and, and ISIS in, in Syria, they have found and they have infiltrated many places under the same umbrella of Islamism into some of those uh, refugee camps in, in Syria. What we have seen throughout what they call the Arab Spring that turned out to be a very cold, bloody winter is that in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood took office. And that was a turning point in the relationship between the Palestinians, specifically Hamas and their groups, and the Syrian government. And that happened when Dr. Mohammed Mursi, the president of Egypt, who was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, started to raise the flag of the Syrian opposition, and he started to call for the fall of the Syrian government and, uh, uh, and the president Bashar al-Assad. That didn't stay long, and then we have seen the leaders of Hamas in Gaza, in one of their biggest rallies, taking the flag, and that was the Prime Minister of Palestine, Ismail Haniyeh, taking the flag of the Syrian opposition, and starting to wave it, and calling for the uh, elimination of uh, President Bashar al-Assad in, in Syria. Well, guess what? The Syrian government had been supporting Hamas all those years, and that what they were doing is uh, they were harboring many of the leaders that were out in many other places around the world. So Khaled Mash'al, who is the leader of Hamas, the top leader of Hamas, had four houses in Damascus offered by the Syrian government. And he was offered those four houses, and many of them, are, two of them were secret houses that nobody knew about, for him to hide in order to prevent a an Israeli assassination of that, of that leader. So they were supporting the Palestinians and Hamas specifically um, for a long period of time. And the first offer that Syria got from the Saudi, from the, the Qatari government and the Turkish government, when there was a uh, foreign minister of Qatar, who was also the prime minister of Qatar at, at the time, came with uh, a, a Turkish representative of, of the Turkish government, and they have offered Bashar al-Assad something on a golden plate. He told him, you stay in power, we contain this revolution, but we need few things. One of them is dismantle your relationship with Hezbollah of Lebanon, stop your relationship with, with Iran, and stop supporting Hamas. And of course, that Hamas idea of supporting Hamas was a Turkish-Israeli decision. It's part of, of the offer. The government of Syria refused to do that. They said, okay, no, we are going to stay supporting Hezbollah and Hamas. But when the Muslim Brotherhood won in Egypt, Hamas thought that, okay, well, in Tunisia, we have the Muslim Brotherhood, the governing. We have a Muslim Brotherhood government in, in Saudi Arabia, in, uh, sorry, in, uh, in Egypt. That could happen in Syria. And it's our time to turn around. We should no longer maintain that relationship with the Syrian regime. What the Syrian government did back then, they told the Hamas groups, you can no longer cover you. You're on your own. You are not working with us. And we are in a situation that is so dear that you cannot continue like that. You can either be with us yeah, or neutral, but you cannot be against us in, in that scenario. When the leaders of Hamas went out, Al-Yarmouk, 
camp, which is one of the areas that has enjoyed everything like any other Syrian area, became a harbor to many of the Islamist fundamentalists who, again, they seem that they beat the same drums as ISIS and, and Jabhat uh, and Nusra. And they started to work their operation out, operations out, military operations, from that camp. The Syrian government wants to control every area in Damascus and in Syria, and they want to prevent, and they're fighting every opposition groups. And there were opposition groups in that area. To their surprise, is that many of those opposition groups that were militarized and they were fighting the Syrian regime were Palestinians. So that was a big blow to, to the Syrian government. And they could not contain that in, a, in an easy way. The second thing is that those groups that were operating in that camp, they started to collaborate and dig underground all kinds of tunnels to get support and military equipment into that camp. So that camp was kind of becoming to be one of those hubs for the ISIS-like groups and the uh, Jabhat al-Nusra-like -like groups. So the government forces ended up being in a big fight in, in this. And just like any other place in Syria, where the opposition goes in, that's where the challenges happen, and that's where people started to flee and become refugees. There is no area that is controlled by the government of Syria where it has people that flee. Even those who oppose the government, as long as the government is in charge, they are staying in there. The government will only interfere in their lives if they hold, have, uh, hold military weapons and they start fighting. Otherwise, they are continuing their lives as, as usual. So we see in Araka, we see in Darizur, we see in Hasaka, we see in Aleppo, all those 10 million or 11 million Syrian refugees that went out, four of them are outside the country, and close to 7 million they are displaced inside the country. Damascus has doubled its population. Latakia has tripled its population, and many other towns in Syria that are under the government control, they have double or triple their, their populations. People in this refugee camp became refugees like the other groups. But the government of Syria was not targeting Palestinians there. The government of Syria was fighting Islamist groups within those refugee camps that became way under, uh, out of control and they could no longer sustain or keep the, these operations running this way. So the Yermuk camp in Syria is just very similar to many places in Syria. In Aleppo, in Hasaka, in Raqqa, or any other cities where the forces of ISIS, Jabhat al-Nusra, or any one of those 1187 declared groups that are fighting the government, exist. And that 1187 groups was part of a report that was identified by the MI6, the British intelligence, and the, and the German intelligence. They've documented them, and about 100,000 people of those, they come from 82 different countries. So, you name it, and they're all coming under the same umbrella of, of Islam. And the reason this is happening is that they're trying to go under the same agenda of a group that is part of the Muslim Brotherhood. The president of Turkey, Erdogan, falls under that umbrella. The former president of Egypt, falls under that umbrella, Dr. Mohamed Mursi. The former Prime Minister or President of uh, uh, Tunisia, Al-Marzouki, they belong to the same groups. 
And of course, Hamas goes into the same group, and they go, they follow the same teachings of Hassan al-Banna, created the Muslim Brotherhood in 1928. In that land, nobody disputes and prevents, and including all the seculars and all the Democrats, and myself, the Muslim groups, brother, Muslim Brotherhood, and any other group, they have the right to take power. After all, they are they belong to the Sunni sect, and there's about 300 million Arabs, about 270 million of those are Sunnis, the vast majority. But they sh if they have to do it, they should do it first in a democratic way, through elections, and number two, without altering the lives of all the other groups, whether they're Christians, or Jews, or Yazidis, or, uh, or Alawites, or other um, progressive Muslims, or Shiites, or, or seculars, or atheists, you name it, these people existed. And they have the right to exist as citizens. What the Muslim agendas are trying to prepare there is that they want to introduce Sharia law, and with the introduction of Sharia law in these countries, the biggest problem that we're trying to face is that minorities are going to be persecuted. Uh, we've seen it in the behaviors of ISIS. They created the Islamic State, what they call it. They, put, they have its headquarters in Raqqa. And every time they have somebody who opposes them, they will behead them. Whether they are, we've seen the Yazidis, we've seen the Kurds, we've seen they're beheading almost everyone that does not subscribe to their agenda. Even if they are Sunnis, but moderates. You're either fundamentalists with us, or not. And, and there are lots of very uh, brutal situations that they have treated people. They have killed a 15-year-old in Aleppo because he swore something against Prophet Muhammad. So, any kid, when they're upset, they'll probably swear about anything. You can't behead them like that. Okay. Let alone they're beheading other people just because they're conquering their houses and they are not part of their religion or that they are army members or fighters. That, these are key aspects. So those are some basic prospects that I think exists in, in Palestine and, and Syria. I'm talking to lots of Palestinians, and one main speaker who was supposed to be here, um, Ms. Amal Wahdan, from, uh, from Palestine, and spoke with her. And there is a big movement in Syria, uh, sorry, in Palestine, that they think Syria uh, is their big home. And that they believe that Palestinians and the Palestinian people and the land of Palestine is the southern part of Syria and that they think they belong as pre the Sykes people accord and they still talk about these uh, type of things. And the same types of movements, they're coming under different, some of them are women movements, some of them are just democratic movements. They put the onus and they point their fingers most of the time on the Saudi government that has been collaborating with Israel secretively, but now it's becoming so public because they're seeing a common enemy in Iran. And they're trying to collaborate together, and the Palestinian people are paying a big price because of that. And Palestinians in Syria are suffering because of this. Palestinians in Lebanon are suffering because of this. And Palestinians in many places around the world are suffering because of this. Let alone the Western world, the Western world who they think that the Palestinians have, well, they talk about human rights, and they should have their rights preserved. In 1947, when they had, in the United Nations resolutions for the creation of the State of Israel, they said they were going to create a Palestinian state. Until now, we don't have a Palestinian state. It has never been created. And the 22% that they talked about that they're going to create the state of Palestine on are 
no longer 22% of the land because Israel illegally occupies and expands its settlements on all those lands. And the last discussions, they spoke about 13% and land swapping, and they built the upper tide wall and they have kind of annexed lots of parts of, of that land. They, know, they don't want a Palestinian state. Forget about that. And in the last uh, couple of months, the moron foreign affairs minister of, of Israel, uh, Avigdor Lieberman, he even had the guts to write a letter to the United Nations and the Security Council for them to recognize the Golan Heights as Israeli territories. The Golan Heights have been occupied in 1967. The Israeli Knesset annexed that in 1981. But every year there is a declaration from the United Nations or the Security Council that says in the Golan Heights we have an illegal occupation. In the Golan Heights, uh, the <coughs> resolution 473 declares that this is a Syrian territory that is occupied by Israel, but the Israelis are expanding their settlements into, into this uh, area. So, this is a general synopsis of what, what is going on uh, in, in the region. Things are changing a little bit. And now those changes are mostly happening because of various things. The first thing is the resolution that we had with the P5 plus 1 with Iran. So the drums of war were being beaten all the time that we're going to bombard Iran because Iran is trying to get nuclear weapons. Well, President Putin in his uh, last uh, press conference, he spoke about not the last one, probably uh, a few weeks ago, he spoke about that big achievement and he thanked President Obama and he said President Obama could add this to his achievements that we could resolve conflicts around the world without wars. We don't have to bomb Iran. We could work with Iran, engage Iran, give some incentives to Iran and ask them to Stop enriching uranium to 80% and 20%, and now they are only enriching to 2 or 3% for civil uh, uses, isotopes, and for, for medicals, and, and probably uh, generating electricity. And we could avoid miseries like the ones that we've seen in Iraq, like the ones that we've seen in Libya, like the ones that we're seeing in, in Syria, and political solutions and diplomatic solutions are are always possible. So this is something that we all call for and we think that it should happen. The second thing that is also uh, helping achieve this type of goal is the last coup that happened in, in Turkey. The coup d'etat or the attempt for a coup d'etat happened in, uh, in Turkey has created lots of internal troubles for, for Turkey and now they are trying to deal with it their internal affairs. But the challenging thing that existed is Turkey, or the President Erdogan, have uh, said that Fatallah Gulen and his groups were perpetrators of that coup d'etat. That the United States has been involved, or they knew about it, and they are an ally, and they are a NATO country, and they were, were not productive. And of course, the last two days we've seen President Erdogan meeting with President Putin of Russia. There is nothing public that confirms that there's gonna be a solution in Syria because of this. However, uh, President Putin declared that uh, we are in agreement on the solution in Syria in a press conference. And President Erdogan said that we're going to open a new chapter and a new page on the Syrian relations. So those are promising things because Turkey has about 900 kilometers borders with Syria and the majority of the infiltration of funds, military equipment, and militias were going through those, through the, those Turkish borders. 
And what we have seen in Aleppo now that the government is tightening its grip on Aleppo and they are going to liberate it very soon. And this only happened in the last month after the coup d'etat in, in Turkey. What we have seen, we've seen that the government of Syria is closing that on, on, on Aleppo. Why? Yeah. Aleppo is very close to the Turkish border. It's about 60 kilometers from the Turkish border. And the Turkish soldiers, government, uh, they were supporting the militias to, to the end. And that's how they sustained their presence in, uh, in Aleppo. Uh, we hope that the Syrian crisis is going to an end. Uh, and with that, Palestinians are going to uh, especially the ones who were in, in Syria, are probably going to go back. The ultimate goal is for them to go into Palestine, but if they could go to, uh, back to Syria and they enjoy uh, their lives as they used to, to do before, uh, before the crisis, and this will not happen without the efforts of every possible individual and every possible group around the world. And I thank you uh, for uh, your atten attendance. And I welcome all questions, differing opinions, challenging uh, uh, opinions to that. Uh, I happen to know a lot about the area. I grew up there. I traveled. And I, I, am, I am engaged. In no way I have authoritative opinions. Okay? I try to use my logic as much as I can. So uh, I welcome every comment and every question from you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh... Um, we have a small group, so we can have a good discussion here if people wish to uh, make comments. Um, and uh, we could even have a little back and forth. Yeah. So um, I'm going to go around and, get, and ask people if they'd like to sign up for the Serious Solidarity Movement email list. And uh, people can raise their hands or. Uh, this would be a good time if, if, if anyone would like to if anyone would like to ask a question, Richard. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, uh, it's very confusing what we get from Turkey right now. Yeah. Now Turkey, I think today in the newspaper I read that they want to do uh, they're going to do uh, joint uh, missions with Russia into uh, Syria to uh, against ISIS, but. Everything happened so fast, and uh, yeah. that that coup d'état is hard to understand how it went about, and who, who's behind all this, and uh, they, they blame. He, but Erdogan has his own agenda also. Uh, did he know about it before? Uh, did he, because he managed to evade everything, and the, the way he responded was really quick. Uh, did he? What happened with him and uh, the United States that suddenly, some, you know, and, and he, he, turned, he became a turncoat? Yeah. And uh, what's the relation now between Israel and Turkey? Yeah. Because it's very ambivalent. Sometimes they go against, uh, they, 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 they are very forceful against them. And then they sign all kind of treaties with them. And uh, yeah. anyway. This is a thesis, actually. Uh, I'll backtrack a little bit uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I was moderating a panel in, in Ottawa between David Kelberg, who is the former Secretary of State for, for Canada, and uh, another lady who was uh, uh, the chair of the Educational uh, and Cultural Center of, uh, of Turkey, or Turkish Educational Center in Ottawa, who is a member of the Fathallah Gulen movement. Uh, and of course, uh, some stuff uh, that are interesting became, became uh, much clearer for uh, for me. Uh, in Turkey, Erdogan has enjoyed a good reign for a good 10 years. Uh, no doubt he was a very successful prime minister in Turkey, and uh, of course uh, he was a very successful uh, president after, after that. And that success goes back to the public ones. The economy of Turkey flourished big time under Erdogan. Okay. Unemployment drop down. Industrial uh, advancements became so huge under, uh, under Erdogan. So as a prime minister, he did very well for, for his people. 
In Turkey, secularism and religion are very important. About 50% of the people, they look at secularism and nationalism together as, as key elements of the country. And about 50% of the people, they think that religion is the most important uh, thing. But since the days of Ataturk, the founder of the uh, New Turkey, Turkey has been run as a secular state, and the army has a major role in Turkey. This attempt for coup d'etat was the fourth in, in Turkey. And we've seen successful ones before. And Erdogan belongs to the uh, Islamist um, party, uh, the, the Justice and Development Party, but before him, there was an attempt by the Islamist groups to win governance in, uh, in Turkey. So they won by elections. And Najmiddin Arbakan, the Prime Minister of Turkey, was the leader of the Arafah party. He wanted to change the constitution, he wanted to change the uh, army, the, he wanted to change everything all at once. Just like Mohammed Mursi wanted to do in Egypt. And the army told him, oh, stop. Within a year, they came, they eliminated him, they dismantled his party, and Erdogan was the member of his party. But there was an Islamic movement that was strong. Uh, there was lots of uh, corruption, economy is not doing well, people want change. Okay? And that change is going to happen. Uh, many people in governments around the world, they would change regimes just for the sake of change, by protest votes. The majority of Palestinians did not like Hamas, but they voted in Hamas what was a protest vote because of the corruption of the Palestinian Authority. Okay. And we've seen that in, uh, in many places around, uh, around the world. In Turkey, Erdogan was not allowed to run for, president, uh, for, for parliament in the first place after a Rafah party. But when, when his party won, he was the leader of his party, they went into the first session of parliament and they had a new uh, bill that allowed him to run for office. And they did a by-election and he ran again so that he could become prime minister. But for a three months period, Abdullah Gul became the prime minister of, of Turkey. But everyone is a very intelligent person. He learned the lesson from Najmuddin Arbakan. He wanted to change everything in Turkey slowly but surely. And he did that very well. He did that very well by having lots of groups, of his groups, go into the army, sign up for the army, and they become officers and rank officers over a period of time. One of the cultural groups that was very successful was the Fathallah Gulen group. It's an Islamist group, again. And Fathallah Gulen was an ally of Erdogan for about 10 years. So his groups were given green light to do whatever they want. They have thousands of schools, hospitals, cultural centers. They, their uh, backers enjoyed support at every level. Some of them are deans at universities, chancellors. Uh, they went into the judiciary. Uh, in two th they had media outlets. In 2013, in 2013, there were lots of corruption that was happening in, in Turkey. The Fathallah Gulen groups started to point their fingers on that corruption. They are an ally of Erdogan, but they started to point their fingers on the, the corruption. And the media outlets of Fathallah Gulen started to name the names. So Erdogan could not flee them. And a few of his ministers, had, he had to eliminate a few of his ministers. So he wanted to clean. But they had big files. And that even got to his family, to his son, and to his daughter. And it started to become big. So Fathallah Gulen became an enemy of Erdogan. And he put himself in exile, and he lives in, in the United States, I think, in Pennsylvania. But he still inspires a lot of, of the Turks in, in Turkey. And when Erdogan had that grip on power. All the opposition parties became weak. His number one enemy that could eliminate him in elections is Fathallah Gulen. And he had, he has been waiting for the moment to eliminate his, 
uh, movement. So as soon as this coup d'etat happened, and whether the conspiracy talks, whether it was a planned coup d'etat by, by, by Erdogan himself, or all of those, it doesn't matter. The result is one, is that he tightened his, his, his grip on power, and he started eliminating all the Gulenists. So he prevented three million people from traveling outside the country. The day, day one, 2,847 members of the judiciary were arrested. That's the judiciary. Yeah. 8,000 8, plus uh, army members and officers, and, and that went to expand. Teachers, they closed about 1,200 schools that uh, and they sent messages to every country around the world that they think they are alive. They wanted to crack down on the Fathallah Gulenis groups because they had cultural centers all over the world. They also they asked the Canadian government to crack down on the Fathallah Gulenis group. And Minister of Foreign Affairs, Stephen Dion, told them we had that call before, a few months before the coup d'etat happened. So this is a recurring call. It was something that was planned before. Unless we have critical evidence, we will not do anything that they were involved in in the coup d'etat. And Turkey said that they handed evidence to the United States to hand them for Halabulin, but they, but they never did so. So Erdogan did not get what he wants from all the Western nations, and his relationship with Europe, with uh, the United States is becoming very cold. But it is very well known that he tries to take advantage of these types of situations. It's not the first time. When the Europeans were having problems with Russia about Ukraine, he received President Putin in, in Turkey. They had deals for having gas pipelines go through Turkey giving gas to Turkey at much better prices, and not only that, helping create the first nuclear Turkish plant, okay, peaceful nuclear Turkish plant. So he took advantage of that. And of course, the biggest power, the Russians and the Americans, they, um, they're not angels, okay? They both try to step on each other's toes, and whenever there is a chance, they, they would do it. So now, the relationships between the Western countries, Europe, and the United States, and Turkey is not going well. Although Turkey have downed or gunned down a, a Russian plane in Syria, and the relationships became so bad between both countries, Erdogan took that opportunity to call President Putin to visit Russia to tell him that the pilot who gunned this Russian plane, we have come down to it, is in prison. And he went and he gave a written apology and he wrote, I don't know the, the word exactly specifically, I apologize in Russian, not in Turkish, not in English, not in, in Russian. So he wrote the letter, but he put the word of apology in, in Russian to send a strong. And of course, uh, President Putin accepted that, and he said, okay, we're going to work with you in order to find a solution in, in the region. There are two major factors that exist in, in that area that there are, are interests among them. Russia wants to fight ISIS. The Americans probably want to fight ISIS because they're going out of control. But for Turkey, the biggest enemy in there is the Kurdish groups who want to establish a Kurdish state. And for them, the longer that ISIS fights them, so the longer that ISIS fights the Kurdish groups, the better for them. As, as you talk about Kur uh, Kurds, I just want to expand. The other thing is the Kurds are in Iran. They're, they're, they're in, in Iran, Iraq, Turkey. Iraq, Turkey. Iraq, and Turkey. Now, the United States in Iraq is trying to form a separate province or autonomous province. They did already. 
yeah, yeah. and Syria also. They wanted to do the same thing in Syria. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and then you have Turkey and, 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 Iran. and Iran is involved. So the, the Kurdish problem is a lot more yeah. uh, important because it brings everything else in, uh, in the same perspective. In, in the same perspective. So, you know, I'll let you continue, but if you want to expand with the Kurds afterwards. Well, there's about 20 million Kurds in the region there, yeah. but the majority of them are in Turkey. So there's about uh, 2 million in Iraq, 1 million in Syria, about a, a million and a half. But about 15 million in, uh, in Turkey. And they're very strong in Turkey. I mean, in the last election, they got 11% of the vote. They had 88 MPs, members of parliament and, uh, in Turkey. Uh, in this election, it was a little rigged. They pushed them to drop below 10%. And anybody who, any party who goes below 10% doesn't get any, any, any seats in parliament and their votes get transferred to the top party, which is Erdogan's party. <laughs> so they had an election, Erdogan had a minority government. So he called for an election, and he made sure that the Kurds do not surpass the 10%, so that he could get all their votes, and they get zero seats. Okay? And he gets, uh, he gets to form a majority government again. So those are our, our major factors now. Turkey, I think, with that imbalance that is happening within the country and the challenges that, uh, that it, is, uh, it is facing, is shaking hands with, um, with Russia. Uh, they thanked, and uh, that's Erdogan thanked President Bashar al-Assad, because President Bashar al-Assad, in an interview, uh, was asked about his opinion in the uh, coup d'etat, and he told him, this is an internal Turkish matter that we do not comment on it. We do not interfere in other sovereign countries' situation. And, well, Erdogan did not do the same thing. Okay? And that was a message, and he, he thanked him in the press, and he said, our enemy Bashar al-Assad did not want to interfere, and our allies <laughs> are interfering and supporting, uh, supporting that. So th that, that was clear for them. Uh, Iran closed its borders right away with Turkey the day of the coup d'etat. And they said, okay, they want to make sure there are no fifth column getting into place that trying to, to exploit that. And they don't want anybody to say, okay, the Iranians are interfering in, um, uh, in this. And, and they, they've done well in, uh, in that type of, of situation. So Turkey now is extending its hand to, to Russia. And given that the Tur Kurdish problem is, is common, the Iraqis don't want an independent Turkish state. The Kurdish state, the Iranians don't want that, the Turks don't want that, the Syrians don't want that, and this is a common denominator too. Mm -hmm. so, so that common denominator could be utilized in a sense. Everybody has an interest in fighting the ISIS. Okay? So if they agree that they cannot, if they agree that they will not allow a Turkish, Kurdish state to exist, nobody have an interest in uh, ISIS to stay, and Turkey would have no interest in ISIS to stay. And uh, NATO right now is. Can I have some questions from other people, please? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just continuing, and I'll be finished after. But NATO, with the Kurds, uh, they want to break down all these countries uh, with autonomous. But Turkey is a member of NATO. Yeah. Turkey would not allow that. And Turkey has the second largest and strongest army in NATO after the United States. So they would not allow that under any circumstances. Yes, please. I thought that Syria, the Syrian government, was. I thought the Syrian government was like the the last bastion of secularism in the Arab world. Why then did he support Hamas? I mean, you equate supporting the Palestinians with supporting Hamas, but no. this is a political choice, yes. and it might have been a big mistake. That's that's a very good uh, question. Uh, you gave the answer, and your answer was a big mistake. Uh, of course, uh, Syria is uh, the, the last bastion. It's, it, it's a secular state. It's a, it's a civil state uh, that uh, we want many other places in the Arab world to, to do the same. They would look after their people. And of course, by no means I endorse all the policies of Bashar al-Assad. There should be political reforms happening in, in Syria. 
the Syrian people should have uh, uh, independent political parties uh, that would work uh, on the ground with, with, uh, with no pressure from, from the government. That they would hold fair elections and everybody would have the right to be represented in parliament. And so the Syrians wanted some uh, reforms uh, to happen. And I think there should be some pressure on the Syrian government for that to happen. But that, uh, that's fine. But you don't have to destroy the government, you don't have to destroy the country and bring all the democratic friends of Syria, uh, the democratic friend, uh, uh, the democratic friends of Syria, and we call, uh, as Hillary Clinton called them, and those included Saudi Arabia, where women cannot vote, and that's a democratic friend of Syria, and the despotic regime of government of Qatar, that never had a constitution, never held an election in their life, and they are a democratic friend of, of Syria, and they're calling for eliminating a dictator as if there are elections in, in their countries. No, we want to call a spade a spade and we want to make sure that reforms are enacted in Syria, but these are enacted by the right people, by the Syrian people, by the ballot box, not by, not by bullets. Given all of, all of this, the situation in the Middle East is so complex and it's complicated uh, in the sense that Israel still occupies a big part of uh, uh, of the region there. They still, they occupied southern Lebanon for about 22 years um, between 1978 and 2000. There was a United Nations resolution 425 that the United Nations said, okay, Israel illegally occupies southern Lebanon. But the biggest players in the world, they tend to look at the United Nations resolutions as a buffet. The menu, they pick and choose from them. Okay, well, Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait, we take a United Nations resolution, and we go and we invade Iraq and we force him out of, of Kuwait. But Israel occupies southern Lebanon, we declare this as an illegal occupation, we have a United Nations resolution, but we do nothing about it. Israel illegally occupies the Golan Heights, we say, and we reiterate this year after year, that this is illegally occupied, but we do nothing about it. So it was left to the resistance groups and liberation movements to do that. And this is why in Lebanon we had in the uh, 70s many resistance groups, and that included all kinds of groups in Lebanon. Uh, they had uh, communists fighting Israel, they had um, Syrian nationalists, they had the Amal groups, they had the Muslim Brotherhood, and finally, Hezbollah, and in 2000, the majority of the Lebanon, Lebanon was, was liberated. There's, there's still the Shiba farms and, uh, and um, seven other villages that Israel still illegally occupies those. Israel still occupies the Golan Heights. So Syria went into war with Israel two times, in 1967 with Egypt and in 1973. In 1982, they were fighting in Lebanon in a, in a ground war with, with Israel. But Syria, they found that, okay, we're going to be part of that peaceful process that was initiated in 1992. Uh, President Hafez al-Assad went with President Clinton. They held a meeting in Geneva uh, for eight hours. They could not agree on the little details um, to, at, the, at the end. And later on, Without handshakes, talks began. Israel and Syria were still at war. Uh, when Farouk Shara, the foreign affairs minister of, of Syria, and Yehuda Barak, who was the prime minister of Israel, they um, they they met in, in the United States. They could not reach any agreements. Throughout all of that, Israel is expanding its settlements, and Syria wanted to have viable groups to support them. So anybody who was fighting Israel, Syria had an interest in supporting them. And that included Hamas, and that included Hezbollah, and that included um, many other factions. Some of them are secular, some of them are communist, from left, from left to right. Yeah. Is this the best thing that they should do? No. Now they regret that they have harbored them, they supported them, they, uh, they use everything, because their sense of belonging to the Islamism or Islamist, Islamist agenda was much stronger than the relationship with, with their allies who have supported them all the way 
uh, to do whatever they want in Palestine. There was a comment from uh, Russia in the yes, back. Yes. Uh, I have two quick questions. One, one is, uh, do we have any indications now, like for recent polls or so on, that, that the majority of Syrians would support the, you know, the, the government of Syria now, the, the government of Bashar al-Assad? Are there elements? And, and my second question is, um, I'm trying to understand who supported the latest push by the jihadi groups uh, in Aleppo, in, in the east side of Aleppo. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because of all what you said about Turkey, yeah. so that means Turkey stops, uh, well, it's supposed to have stopped yeah. uh, helping them. Is it that they decided to go on their own because they were strangled and it was their last chance? Yeah. Or is Saudi Arabia still willing to continue supporting them to make more chaos? Who, who you know, it seems that on the ground they are losing. Yeah. But the supporters are ready to continue yes. to making chaos. And I would like to hear your answer. Sure. Uh, on the first question, uh, in 2012, uh, the Doha debate, uh, which is mainly under the auspices of the Qatari government, they uh, did a survey. And uh, it was a scientific survey uh, looking at the support for President Bashar al Assad. And 56% of the Syrians supported Bashar al Assad back then, mm -hmm. and it was in the LA. They did not want to publish the results, but the results were leaked uh, out because that was not in their favor. They wanted to do a survey that, after the propaganda war that they did in the media, that they think, okay, the majority of the Syrians are against him, and they would say, okay, well, this is a scientific survey that says Bashar al Assad does not enjoy support. So 56% of the Syrians were supporting Bashar al Assad. Mm -hmm. That was before ISIS started to do all the beheadings, and there were many people uh, belonging to the silent majority, those sort of people in Syria that they think, okay, well, uh, we don't care about the Shah al-Assad, but we don't care about the opposition, we want stability in our life, uh, we don't have strong opinions of anything. Mm -hmm. A year later, uh, there was another survey that was commanded, and uh, President Bashar al-Assad had enjoyed 72% support of the, of the Syrian people. With time, that support is increasing. It's increasing because of two things. The number one thing is that all those people who were promising that democracy is going to come to Syria and we're going to eliminate the dictator, and Assad is going to fall within two weeks. In Lebanon, there is a guy called Samir Jaja. He was called the two weeks man. Every, you would say, Bashar, Bashar Assad will fall within the next two weeks. He's going to fall within the next two weeks. And he kept declaring that to the extent that uh, most of the media, people started to uh, put him saying this with, with dates and, uh, and they kind of told him, you shut up, you never, you never talk about this anymore. And it's not only about him, we've seen Sarkozy declaring that, we've seen Cameron declaring that, we've seen President Obama declaring that, and then Assad must go and Assad should go and it's about the last month. And they've seen that President Assad has a uh, big and strong majority of people supporting him within Syria. Uh, so that's, uh, yes, uh, this is the, uh, these are results of the elections. So even at the war, uh, Syria held many elections. They had a constitution, uh, a new constitution, and they put that to a referendum. And it passed, and they said that the Syrian uh, uh, institutions are still working on this. They had a first uh, elections and then they got another uh, elections uh, lately. That elections, uh, so that's the presidential elections. They had 78% turnout, 87% supporting President Assad. But lately this year they had parliamentary elections. I got that too. You got that too? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Well, that's a good backup. <laughs> so those numbers are huge. Close to 9 million people are eligible to vote in, in Syria, more than 5 million people um, uh, joined. Yes, yeah, a little uh, The polls were expanded to 11 p.m. in Damascus, but in the Syrian embassy in Lebanon, they were put to 12 p.m. because there were lots of refugees in Lebanon who wanted to go and cast their ballots. And, uh, 
58% participation rate. That's commensurate with many of the advanced democracies, okay. except for the last election. Uh, in Canada, we had a higher turnout at 69%, but the elections before that was 59%. Uh, and of course, um, this was overseen by uh, delegates um, from 30 different countries. I've been asked by the media a lot about the first election that has happened, that they did not allow uh, the media to go, and I said no. They did not allow CBC, that's true. They did not allow Al Jazeera, that's true, because you're waging a propaganda war. But there were media outlets from Japan, from Algeria, from Brazil, from China, from many other places around the world. Okay? All those neutral media outlets, they got passes, they went into Syria, and they covered the, the elections. But if you are running the propaganda war against a specific country, it means you are coming to that country with an agenda. You're going to go into, into Syria, you're probably going to look at 50 places, you're going to find one thing that is bad and present only that one, uh, that one thing. And this is why those media outlets that are waging the propaganda war were not allowed to be in, in, uh, in Syria for, for that election. In that election, there was a coalition of parties it's called the Progressive Front. They had 170 MPs from that. And there's about 80 members in the 250 uh, chamber that are independents uh, or belonging to smaller parties that were not part of that Progressive uh, uh, Front. So you see, these numbers legitimately would say that the Syrian government enjoys big support. Yeah. So when you have 5 million people show to the polls in wartime. In wartime. Yeah. And the biggest thing that I've seen on Lebanese media is that there's about a million refugees in Lebanon. Most of the media speak about that refugees that are supportive of the regime, they flee inside Syria and they stay under government uh, uh, held areas. And all those who came to Lebanon are opposition. So when the these people, many people in the opposition, they were uh, avoiding to go to the polls, or they were just uh, saying that they were, were not going to participate in this election. The majority of the refugees in Lebanon went. They were in demonstrations of tens of thousands of people in front of the, uh, of the embassy, the Syrian embassy. They had to open the polls until 12 midnight for them to allow uh, to allow them in, uh, to allow them to, to vote, and they have proven, been proven otherwise that the majority of the refugees in Lebanon are supported by the regime, not the other way around, because it was about 93 percent in the Syrian embassy in Lebanon in support of the government party. So even more than the ones that are in Syria. So, so you think that well, the ones in Syria they are under the regime watch, or they're, they're forced, or whatever it is. Well, those are in Lebanon, and these are refugees, and their numbers were much more supportive of the, uh, of the government of, of Syria. Not only that, the Syrians, many of those who came out, they would like to go back to Syria. And even that they know that they, they hold a grip of power. There is a Syrian family that was being sponsored to come to Canada. Uh, we helped, we, we rented them a house, we f furnished that house, we even filled the refrigerator with everything that they need because in two days they were coming from Lebanon to Canada. Well, guess what? Their village was liberated in Syria. They canceled coming to Canada. So we're going to go back to our village because it is liberated now. So, so not every refugee, those are refugees that are out there, they would like to go back to their home. All that they need is peace and stability, and they think that the government could give them that peace and stability. Once the government liberated their town, they were willing to go back to their town and, and, and live in there. And we had to sponsor another family and go through another process to, to, get, uh, into, to get them into, into Canada. So th this, this is a, just a small example to show you how these things happen. 
Your second question, Rashad, sorry. Uh, I don't time. want to, to take all yes. the time, so why, why don't we take sure. all the time? Um, I'm sorry, I came a little late, but if I understood what you were saying, the, the kind of the key moment for in 2011 was when Morsi and Hamas thought the time had come for the Muslim Brotherhood to make a move and take over the, the Syria. Uh, yeah. And I, I think you implied that, or I understood that it, this this meant working with uh, uh, the ISIS formations at that time and, and the, the extremists. And yet, um, I don't quite follow that because Mar Marcy, his when he became elected as president of Egypt, his strongest opposition was actually the Salafists, who were much closer to that. And so it seemed to me he had a clear differentiation with that crowd. And, and the Muslim Brotherhood had a clear idea of who the Salafists were. So what, why are, are am I wrong in thinking that you're saying that they were working together against um, there's, uh, uh, there's nothing against wrong with it. Everything is relative. There's nothing wrong with nothing right. But uh, in my previous life, I was the director of national outreach for the Liberal Party of Canada. And uh, <laughs> I have worked with the National Democratic Institute of Washington, and I held political parties in Egypt. I went six times to Egypt, twice before the revolution and four times after the revolution. And every time I went there, I stayed between two weeks and six weeks. I know Egypt more than any other Egyptian. Went to 24 governorates. I worked, I worked with 17 political parties from the far left communists to the far right, uh, right Salafist and Nur party and everything in between. And what I can tell you is that the Muslim Brotherhood agenda uh, is international. In Egypt, specifically, in Egypt, everybody is religious. You've got about 90% of the people, or 88% of the people are Muslims. They're very religious, the majority of them. You've got the 12% Christians, and they're very religious, the majority of them. Okay? I don't want to generalize, but the majority are, are like that. In 2005, the Muslim Brotherhood won a big group of seats, about 90 seats in, in Parliament. And Morsi was the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood bloc in, in Parliament. He was not the chosen leader of the Muslim Brotherhood. They, want to, they wanted to have Khairat al-Shatr, who was not allowed to run. Uh, just like Erdogan in Turkey, uh, he had a file prevented him from, from running for elections, so they chose him as the alternate president uh, who, who could run. But while I was there, there were many groups who were offshoots of the Muslim Brotherhood because there were divisions among them. Just like in Turkey, Erdogan and Gulen were working together for about 10 years, and now Fathallah Gulen is his main opposition, they're both Islamists. Similarly, in, in Egypt, I've seen uh, Al Wasaf party, so that's the middle party. This used to be the syndicates of the Muslim Brotherhood. So, the Order of Engineers of the Muslim Brotherhood, the Order of Doctors of the Muslim Brotherhood, the, um, all the, the various types of syndicates that exist in Egypt, they said, okay, well, we're not going to go with the Muslim Brotherhood with that agenda. We are going to have a more progressive agenda, and we're going to establish a new party. The youth, or the younger generation, they thought, okay, well, we have a different perspective then, and we're going to create a new party. And they created a new party at Tayyar al-Masri, or the Egyptian current, and it was Muslim Brotherhood. In uh, the Alexandria part, there is a bigger fundamentals group in there. They are they created a newer party, which was a Salafi party. But can you tell the difference between a Salafi or a Muslim Brotherhood or any one of those in Egypt? Absolutely not. The divisions were political in there because uh, the Salafi party or a newer party in Egypt is not associated with ISIS. And at times, they might fight with each other. Like in Syria, Jabhat al-Nusra, who is declared a terrorist organization as a fundamentalist Islamist group, and ISIS, who is a fundamentalist Islamic group, they fought with each other on, in mul on multiple occasions. So they are not one front. They are a multiple front. And each one of them is going to fight in order to 
present themselves on the ground and probably be an alternative to, to power once they think that they, uh, they're, they're going to, uh, to win. So when the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, they collaborate with Hamas, uh, Hamas is not very close with the Salafis. They all go back to the same basics of Islamism, Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, and, and many other scholars. And of course, who puts the money gets to have a say too. Saudi Arabia plays a big, big role in that. Sometimes, or Qatar plays a big role in that. And you will see some paradoxes in these types of situations. In Egypt, for instance, the biggest supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood was Qatar, not Saudi Arabia. But in Syria, the biggest supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood is Saudi Arabia. Okay. On, in, in Egypt, Saudi Arabia is viewed as, a, as an enemy by the Muslim Brotherhoods. In Syria, it's viewed as a friend and a supporter. So it's, there are many of those issues localized in, uh, on the ground as part of the world. And I, I understand you that some of that does not make sense. Yeah. And uh, you didn't mention, and I hesitate to say the words, the, the FSA, the Free Syrian Army, which, which we heard at a, at a grand conference a couple of days ago. It yeah. seemed to be backed by them. They said, well, there are problems with it that got corrupted or taken over by the US or something. But people at this, at this forum have said that it was a legitimate organization that represented the aspirations of the people. So I wonder what your take on that. Uh, this is a very good, uh, very good question. Uh, the Syrian army is one of the largest armies in, uh, in the area. Uh, there had been some people who deflected from, from the Syrian army, uh, but uh, they are way below 5% below uh, in that. Uh, many government, uh, Western government groups, they said, okay, we're going to support those because they don't go under the Islamist agenda. But they all knew that the only way that we could get fighters is going under that Islamist, Islamist agenda. So many of the key players on the Free Syrian Army, they, become, they became uh, members of the Islamist groups. And they established Jaish al-Fatah, Jaish al-Sham, and there is nothing that is called the Free Syrian Army on the ground now. They don't call that. So it's like real politic in a sense. No, no, it's, it's a real politic. They, they started on the ground, but uh, it was noted that they are members of other groups. Uh, I'll tell you an example, for instance, uh, the United States have sent about 140 people who are there trained, they thought that they're going to take and lead some brigades in this. And as soon as they entered from Jordan into Syria, they lost touch with them and they joined Jabhat Nusra and the and, and Jewish Fatih. With their arms. With, with their arms. Okay. So that's the way that things are happening. Um, Senator McCain went to, to Syria and came back and he declared that uh, uh, there are Syrian groups that uh, uh, are not ISIS, they're not Jabhat Nusra, they are, and he went there and he went on the ground and he's an eyewitness, he's seen them. And he came back um, and he did all these uh, talks and of course he wanted to, to wage a war in, uh, uh, from the United States. And Luckily, we have Google, and we have graphic search. All that you need is to just copy the, the face of some of those people and do a search with them. Those three people that were with him, they were searched in Google, and each one of them ended up being somewhere. This one is part of Jabhat Nusra. This person is a member of ISIS, and this person was shown in a video saying Allah Akbar and beheading a Shiite. Shiite pilgrims. Pilgrims. So, his chief of staff had to go and apologize for his statement and saying that he did not know those people who took the picture with him. Hmm. While he was the one who, did, who made this picture of him. And, and he was in Syria without the permission of the Syrian government. Yeah. Exactly. So. For this time, then I would sure, like to come know. back to my question. Sure. My question was about the latest push by yeah. the jihadi groups in Aleppo, no, in no. eastern part, 
It's not a river that was under siege, it was the eastern part. Yes. The western part was under siege by the rebels. Yes. So the, the push, uh, how do you explain it? Is it the rebels themselves who feeling they are strangled, yeah. try last effort? Or let's, is it Saudi Arabia who is still pushing, or what? Let's not underestimate that there are a hundred thousand uh, very well-trained military troops that are fighting the Syrian government this year. These are guerrilla groups, and they come from 82 different countries, and they are very well armed. The biggest blow, blow happened when uh, they took over northern Iraq. When they took over northern Iraq, they had all the equipment of the Iraqi army. Sorry, who took over northern Iraq? ISIS. Okay. They had all the equipment of the Iraqi army. And they took about $425 million from the Mosul banks. And they became the most financed, or the highest financed terrorist group in the world. Okay. And based on this, they started to expand. They're recruiting people based on religious groups. They're recruiting people from Chechnya, they're recruiting people from Pakistan, from Lebanon, from uh, Afghanistan, from everywhere around, around uh, the, the world. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, I am no military expert by any means, but I've listened to a couple of commentators, uh, military generals over the last couple of days who are very aware of what's going on in, uh, in Aleppo. And one of them uh, said that uh, there are lots of tactics that the government of Syria and the, and the Syrian army are going to, to follow. So, Sometimes they win an area with a thousand troops, okay, but they don't settle that area. They want to have those thousand troops to go and liberate another area. And that's when the opposition sometimes, if they have the numbers, they could retake back other places. In the specific case of Aleppo, uh, the government of Syria, or the Syrian army, uh, they had in one place, uh, create, they created a a weak chain, so that, uh, and they advertise that in such a way that the rebels and uh, those uh, uh, terrorists, they would go and come from, from that place so that they could hit them by planes. That's in, in one place. In the other place is that, and that's a, a place where they lost it, really, that the government uh, forces have, have lost it, is this is a specific place where the uh, opposition members, mainly of Jabhat al-Nusra, they had about a thousand uh, suicide bombers ready to go in with 15,000 troops. Okay? And their plan was to pressure, hit, and not run, have another hit, and then a third hit, and a fourth, successive hits on the same, uh, on the same place. So the government forces uh, were not able to, to handle that uh, pressure in, in that area. Mind you that the government forces are fighting in uh, about 20 hot places at the same time. So it's not in the, only on, uh, uh, in, in Aleppo. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that they were able to cut the uh, resources, uh, the resource lines on those is a big achievement. But they have lots of resources. They have been holding uh, the power in, 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 uh, in Aleppo for the last two years. They have established all kinds of bases. Uh, they're strong on the ground. They have lots of tunnels. They have lots of equipment. And they have lots of men on the ground. Uh, it's not easy to defeat them overnight. It's going to take it's going to take time. So even if there is no new equipment that comes, they have enough. They, uh, they have enough uh, and they munitions to, to yeah. fight for a while. Exactly. So it's it's going to uh, to take a little bit. This is not new. Uh, I remember uh, listening once uh, on uh, Lebanese TV to Hassan Nasrallah, who was the leader of uh, Hezbollah, when they were fighting in Al Zabadani area. Al Zabadani is, is a small town, nothing compared to Aleppo, and. As Hezbollah was going, were going in uh, to liberate that, they uh, uh, they had lost many casualties, and then they stopped. And they said, "Okay." He, he said, "Don't ask me for a date. We have a full siege on the city, but it's going to take us long to infiltrate street by street, 
because they have very well equipped people, they have uh, strong men on the ground, and they have they use tactics that are so advanced in guerrilla groups that we will not go and fight uh, and, and lose all our troops inside. And, uh, and they found many groups, many tactics. Hezbollah and Hamas, they used to collaborate together. There were many of the tactics that Hezbollah taught Hamas were used against them in, in Al Zabadan. Yes. I have another question. Yes. Uh, you know, it's about the, the, uh, Turkey and, and Russia, to go back to that. Yeah. I, I, the, the rapprochement between uh, Erdogan and, and uh, Russia, the way you described that made me think that, what, that the shooting down of the Russian plane was by a faction of the army that was not totally under Erdogan's control. I wonder, mm -hmm. like, who, who shot that down and why? Do you, and what, what significance did that shoot down? Uh, strategically, uh, when the coalition that, the illegal coalition that uh, in violation of international law was established to fight ISIS there by the United States, Britain, and, and many uh, other countries, including Canada, uh, they were throwing bombs. Um, they would say, okay, we had uh, 50 fighter jets over the last week, and we think that we have killed 50, 50 terrorists or 60 terrorists. The numbers were not close. And they were bombarding areas that are civilians, like uh, uh, oil wells, command and control uh, centers for uh, oil and gas and dams and all this. So they were kind of destroying Syrian infrastructure. And they did not go in uh, with uh, in collaboration with the Syrian government, uh, in violation of, of international law. So over a six month period, they were not able to advance at all. They were not able to liberate any, any lands of, uh, of ISIS. And not only this, ISIS had traveled from Arraka and from Deir to Palmyra, that historical site. They went in big groups and uh, for about 300 kilometers in the desert under the watch of that coalition with their big flags of ISIS and they did not target them. And that tells, uh, uh, I mean, you, you should question that coalition and whether it is in their to find. This is a picture from Pamir. This is when ISIS was going to Pamir. They are in the desert, in those big fleets, and they could be easily attacked by the coalition forces, and they never did. And that's why we would question whether the coalition forces are there to fight ISIS. Okay. Sometimes they collaborate with them if it uh, helps their purpose. When the Russian government came in and they collaborated, collaborated with, the, with the Syrian government, the Russians gave a, uh, uh, <coughs> an air coverage of the lands, and the Syrian army started to advance to the ground. In over a six month period, they were able to liberate a lot of towns. Yeah? They are big areas, there's about uh, 470 villages that, and towns that were liberated in the first month. Yeah? And they were advancing, advancing a lot, and all that we've seen is that Jabhat al-Nusra in some places, ISIS in some places, and many other factions in some other places, they were collapsing, either backing down or leading or... So it showed that it, it was effective. Uh, at one time, there was a Russian airplane coming close to a Turkish border, and it was shot down by a uh, Tur Turkish plane. So, of course, Russia could retaliate, they could do that. They went on the car. And everybody in Turkey, and all commentators started talking about this, that uh, Turkey is backing down now, and Russia started threatening that Turkey is going to pay a big price for this. There's about 7 million tourists that go every year from Russia to Turkey. They stop them. They told them there are no tours to Turkey anymore. They have started to have some... Turkey has suffered economically big time because, because of that. 
All kind of collaboration that they talked about before, they said we're going to stop that, yeah. including gas uh, and selling gas at, uh, at <clears throat> much lower prices than uh, than the market. Um, talking about the, the, the nuclear plant that they want to stop, they have halted all kinds of relationship. Yeah. So Turkey has suffered big time because because of this. Now, when the Western countries and the allies of Turkey have turned their back on Turkey or, or on Erdogan. They did not hand them Fathala Gulen. They did not. Um, now, yesterday the talk is that, and Erdogan is saying that, that there was somebody from the Woodrow Institute who was on a specific uh, Turkish island talking to the Gulenist generals in that meeting. and. They are trying to point the fingers that the Americans were involved in that who did that. So it's uh, so they are kind of uh, going a step forward, and that's the Turkish government going a step forward in pointing their fingers at uh, at the United States that they they have some role in the coup d'état. If they did not orchestrated themselves, they knew about it and they have done nothing about it uh, in, in the first place. <coughs> so everyone. Is taking advantage of this. He said, okay, well, the captain who have shot down the Russian plane is in custody now. He's going to face charges. He's a member of the Fathallah Gulenist group, which is supported by the United States. And we apologize to Russia about this. So that was clear for them. But the shooting down then, you're saying, was 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 an in, not intentional by the high government level? No. It was a low-level Gulenist decision? Yeah, but uh, Turkey said that before, but they did not want to apologize. But now they've taken the opportunity to take advantage of that. Okay? Uh, we apologize because of that. But could it be that uh, it was decided by Turkey and they are backing down? Very possibly. Very possibly. You know, they're they, uh, yeah. facing the yeah. pressure they yeah. very possible. They, they, they sacrificed this pilot Absolutely. but the order had come from could be well, it could be uh, I mean uh, it's uh, well, what what Turkey is now is in a situation that uh, uh, that is very very special if the Americans were supporting Erdogan probably he would never have backed down uh, on this and the Russians take advantage of this uh, all the time so, I mean the Russians have created all kinds of great ties with El Sisi, the president of Egypt now. And that only happened when the relationship was ruined with, with the United States. The United States started to threaten that they're going to cut funding uh, on, on Sisi, and he told, uh, on uh, El Sisi and, and Egypt. And he told them, well, well, this is part of the agreement in, uh, in Camp David. You want to cut that? That's fine. Okay, we're, we're going to cut all the... Uh, we're not going to go into abide by any of the, the rules that you have set in, in Camp David. The relationship became a little bit cold, and the next thing that you hear is uh, Foreign Minister of Russia, Mr. Lavrov, is visiting Egypt, and a week later, President Sisi is uh, wearing the Russian jacket and going in a tour with President Putin. In, in Sochi, and then they go back to uh, a high level, high level uh, relationship with uh, with Egypt. So, some countries, especially at the strategic level, Russia and the United States, they are fighting now, and Russia is looking for more allies. Okay, the world is no longer in the dollar; it's not the United States that is dicta dictating and declaring things. We are back to some sort of the world war. And the Russians are expanding the, uh, their allies. Every time there is a problem between the United States and another country, Russia has taken advantage of that and jumped on this. Whether the gains are sustainable or long term, time will tell. But Egypt is still implementing the U.S. agenda regarding Palestine, regarding yes. Gaza. Yes. Yeah. Let's have one more question. Yes, please. What about the Turkish uh, wish to enter Europe? Uh, the Turkish plan to uh, enter Europe was 
going to favor Europe, uh, or was going to favor uh, Turkey big time in the early days of the Erdogan government. Uh, there are various uh, things that are going to prevent Turkey from entering into uh, into Europe. There is one cultural difference that, that talks about it. Europe is about 300 million people, Turkey has about uh, 90 million people, and the majority of the Turks are Muslims, so they're going to uh, kind of create a, a, an imbalance of a Europe that has a uh, big uh, group of, uh, of Muslims, probably changing or altering some of the cultural aspects, and they're given the uh, religious freedoms that uh, most of Europe uh, enjoys. That's one thing. The second um, major thing is that Turkey was so keen on entering the European Union, and there were lots of conditions on Turkey that the European Union. There's a big economy for Turkey in uh, that for the Turkish people to go uh, into Europe. However, as I told you before, under Erdogan, the, the Turkish economy has improved big time. I mean, the ranking of Turkey went from uh, 111 to 16th in the world. So Turkey is now a member of the G20. And its, uh, its economy is huge. It's got a big population, large army. Uh, it's not in the best interest of Turkey themselves to go into Europe, especially because Europe is struggling a lot after the 2008 financial crisis. We have seen Greece being bailed out uh, multiple times. We, we, we've seen problems in, uh, uh, in Portugal, in Spain, in Italy uh, on the financial side. And the latest hit with the Brexit saying that Britain is going is to go out. Uh, I don't think economically it's viable for the Turks themselves to uh, enter. After the uh, coup d'etat, uh, the relationships uh, has, has been weakened. And I think uh, a Turkish join to the European Union is going to be off the table for at least 10 years, mm. even to talk about it. Mm. Well. Uh, Other questions? Well, we want to thank you all for being a great audience. This has been a, a vibrant discussion, and uh, um, let's keep working together. Uh, that's how we're going to make a difference in the world, and thank you very much. Uh, I want to uh, finish by saying that uh, on behalf of the Serious Solidarity Movement, we uh, hope that uh, the main you will promote our main message, which is ending the illegal aggression against Syria. And one of the ways that we can do that in Canada is to put pressure on the federal government to restore diplomatic relations with Syria, and I understand that something is in the works about that, and also that we should, uh, uh, we should end the illegal ec economic sanctions that were brought in under the Harper government against Syria, which have turned so many Syrians into refugees. Uh, there are many, uh, there's a wish list there that comes from the anti-war movement that I represent uh, in Hamilton. Um, and uh, we want to see everybody uh, doing their part in Canada to bring, help to bring an end to the war against the, the Syrian people and the Syrian government. Uh, if you were interested on your way out, uh, some people heard this at the beginning, uh, we have postcards here uh, to stop this the arms sale to Saudi Arabia. We have our, uh, our brochure with the Syria Solidarity Movement. Uh, we are, I'm selling this pamphlet uh, that I wrote as a uh, participant in the second international tour of peace to Syria, with, uh, which took place in April, and the third one is going next month, if anyone is interested. This is $5. It's also an e-booklet for $3. You can get it on Amazon, Kobo, or iTunes. And we're also selling these books by Eve Angler, a Montrealer, uh, called Canada and Israel, Building Apartheid. And they're much discounted at five dollars, an excellent book. So thank you again for coming, and uh, we hope that you enjoy the World Social Forum. Have a good day. Thank you, thank you very much.